Hello, everybody. I'm Kendrick Mock with the College of Engineering, and thanks for attending our professional development seminar series. Um, I'm really, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker for today, who is Yuval Boss. He's a machine learning engineer at the University of Washington's Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean, and Ecosystem Studies, and he works with NOAA's Polar Ecosystems Program, which does research around um, marine mammals in the Arctic. And he will be speaking about developing machine learning models and multi-spectral image processing pipelines for aerial population surveys. And um, I'd also like to thank Yuval in advance. Um, he's also agreed to speak at our ISIP conference this next week, which was to be held um, here in Anchorage um, but due to COVID has been moved to um, a virtual platform. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Yuval Boss. Thank you, and thanks for joining uh, everyone. And yeah, so a bit of background already, but uh, today I'll be talking about the work I've been doing in collaboration with NOAA on these surveys, um, and let's get into it. Oh. Um, and so just to give a bit of background uh, on these surveys before I talk about the machine learning side, um, over the past eight or so years, there have been three different surveys, and you can see them on the left here, uh, the different track lines of the survey. And um, at the beginning, it was a very manual effort, and now we're starting to integrate machine learning uh, into the process to help count and um, find the animals. And on the right, you'll see pictures of the plane and the team. Um, so they're currently manned by aerial survey, but the future goal is to move towards UAVs. Um, and so this is what the in-flight system looks like. We have um, a storage device to store all the images we're collecting. Uh, we have three compute nodes, uh, one per camera pod. And so we have nine cameras. There's a thermal, a color, and an ultraviolet camera in each pod. Um, so nine cameras total, and there's one compute node per each set of three. Um, and so this compute node contains a 1080 Ti for machine learning and it also processing power for other embedded work that needs to be done. And then there's also the control where the scientists on board actually can start and stop the system. They can start and stop detectors and they can kind of view the feed um, to see if any changes need to be made to sort of the camera parameters. Um, and so here are some examples of the imagery that we collect. Um, we only this spring started collecting ultraviolet imagery. So what I talk about in this presentation won't really include that as we haven't had a chance to really uh, integrate that into our machine learning workflow yet. Um, and so I'll mostly be focusing on the, the color um, and the infrared imagery. Um, and so the few things to note here are that the color image is very large, as you can see, it's about 4,000 by 6,000 pixels in size, and the thermal is small, um, 512 by 640 pixels, and it is 16-bit, uh, which means that Basically, you have twice the bits to store each pixel uh, information, so you can have a lot more precision with what those values are. Um, so just to give, I think this is final slide about background um, on the surveys, but um, to give a bit of background about how, kind of how we process the data that was collected uh, at the beginning, as I mentioned earlier, it was a largely manual effort. Um, I was actually talking to a colleague the other day because I wasn't around working on this project at that time to kind of get an idea of what they were dealing with and she said that she had to manually review uh, about five terabytes of thermal video, um, which took a bit over a year, I think. Um, and yeah, that, that's not something that anyone wants to be doing. And so sort of the goal here is to really be kind of reducing the amount of manual processing effort required. And so that was back in 2012 and 2013. In 2016, um, and this is also before I started working on the project, but they had a blob detector that kind of helped them find blobs in the thermal images. And then they would look at the color images and, um, and try to classify the animal. And so the, in the most recent survey, um, we deployed full machine learning deep models um, that looked at both the thermal and the color image and both detected and classified the animal. Um, and we're sort of estimating that the processing time for this data will be about three months, but we're not 
completely done with that yet. So it's, it's just an estimate for now. Um, and so one thing that's really, uh, I mean, as you see, we have like all these different types of images that we're collecting. Um, what we really want to be able to do is align this data and um, envision that's called image registration. Just, it just means aligning images. Um, and generally the way to do that is to find features in the two different images and to try to match them up. Um, and so this kind of how panoramas work on a phone. Um, and this is what we're trying to do here. But uh, as you can see from this photo, there aren't many good edges uh, or corners or other features um, that are distinct. Um, the thermal features are very different from the color features. There's often small temperature gradients. If you're just looking at ice, meaning you won't really see any features in the thermal image. Um, and feature extraction and matching on large images is really slow. So this isn't really um, a feasible solution for us. And so um, what we flew with in the, lat in the previous survey were really stable camera mounts, meaning that we could rely on the cameras basically always pointing exactly the same um, direction as when we calibrated them. And this is really hard to do because even like a millimeter of movement in the camera is going to throw things completely off. Um, and so a lot of work went into that so that we could align our images. And so just because we have a stable camera mounts doesn't mean we can um, just align the images. We have to actually model those cameras. Um, and so this is the approach we take to do that. Um, so in Washington, we generally fly over Monroe, um, a calibration flight in which we do three figure eights at three different altitudes collecting uh, calibration imagery. And this is just collecting imagery as normal, but we use it to calibrate the camera models. Um, and during this time, we also connect, collect INS data, which is things like latitude, longitude, pitch roll, and um, al altitude. Um, and so the way this works is that we take um, our imagery and we extract features from it, like corners, edges, um, just features, I guess, the SIF features is what we use um, for those that know what those are. And then um, we do exhaustive matching where we compare all the features in all the images to the features in all the other images. Um, and then we reconstruct that and we use a tool called CallMap to kind of do all three of these steps. And so that picture in the top right, um, you can see is the reconstruction. Um, and these are what are called camera intrinsics. They are in just relative coordinate space. There's no idea of what elevation the cameras are at when the photos are taken. Um, and so we combine that with the camera extrinsic BINS data that I mentioned earlier. And that's what allows us to develop these camera models, which will tell us with these camera mounts exactly where each camera is pointed. And that allows us to geo both align the images, um, but also to geo-register them to know where they are on Earth. Um, over time, there is a bit of error. There's a bit of drift in the cameras. Um, and for, and I'll discuss this more later, but for our detection pipelines, we really need pixel level precision. Um, and so we can take some new calibration data and just manually select points in both photos and generate a transformation that works well. But this doesn't provide all the information that the camera model does. And it's just a thing that we do for the detection pipelines. And so here are just some pictures um, generated by the call map tool that I mentioned for the sparse reconstruction. You can see, then this is all automated. You give it all the imagery, you do the three steps, feature extraction, matching, and sparse reconstruction, you end up with something like this. And so these are the three figure eights that we flew in that calibration flight. And so to get an idea of what the final data of why we did all this, um, this is what the final data product from a test survey we flew in 2019 looks like. Um, so as you can see, the track line is pretty sporadic. And generally, when we fly surveys, they're a lot more organized. But um, this was just a test. And all these uh, rectangles are the images projected onto Earth. And the dots are detections. And as you can see in that little um, zoomed in bubble, um, the, the detections on, on the track lines. Um, so now I'll talk about integrating about how we integrate machine learning into these surveys to uh, actually find these animals. And as you'll see on the right is a picture of a model that detected a bunch of seals on ice and how the seals are kind of hard to spot with your bare eyes without the boxes around them. Um, so to start, well, outline the problem on the machine learning end, um, the problem that, and this is kind of where I came into the program. Um, the project had already existed for a long time, but they wanted to use machine learning. 
Um, and so the goals that I had were to detect and classify um, at the beginning two ice seal species and polar bears. Um, they wanted to run at real time, uh, which meant two frames per second. And by two frames per second, that's two thermal color and UV frames per second. So six total frames per second if I'm looking at all the images. Um, to be usable by non-technical users in a GUI interface or some way of delivering um, the machine learning capabilities to scientists and to be reproducible um, because the results from these pipelines um, will be used in, um, in research and publication. Um, some goals that are hard to find and that we still haven't defined well um, are how much production and processing time um, do we want to get? How much auto like how automated can we be with this? Um, and it's hard to define that because it's hard to know how well machine learning will work in your problem when you're just getting started. And then in addition to that, um, what accuracy uh, and what other kind of evaluation metrics are required for the downstream population assessment that the statisticians and biologists do. Um, so the resource I had available to me, and I've already talked about this a bit, are three different types of imagery. Um, uh, three 1080 Ti's, uh, which are just pretty powerful GPUs. Um, and then a data set with 30,000 ring seal annotations, 20,000 were boxes, and 10,000 were point annotations from back when they were doing point annotations. Uh, 4,000 bearded seal box annotations, uh, 2,000 unknown seal box annotations. And unknown means that the person manually annotating wasn't sure which species to classify that seal as. Um, about 300 polar bear annotations and millions of background um, images. And background just means there's no animal, it's just a picture of ice or water or something, and there's just really nothing interesting in that picture. Um, some challenges um, that I'd like to share um, that sort of, they're not super specific to integrating machine learning in research settings. You can definitely find a lot of these challenges in other places, but they are generally pretty big in this kind of setting. Um, and, and the largest one I think is the cross-domain knowledge and communication between scientists and the people developing the machine learning. I think it's beneficial for me as the person developing the machine learning to understand what the scientists are trying to do and even a bit about the domain of what they're studying. Like, are these seals often found by holes in the ice where they pop out of? Um, there's a lot of kind of little things that can help design um, the models. And then for scientists, it's really important to kind of understand the expectations and even how at a high level um, machine learning works on problems like this. Um, another big one um, is technical debt. Uh, we're way behind industry in terms of our machine learning capabilities and that's changing quickly and it's exciting to see, but we're still in the early stages of um, sort of advancing our technical capabilities. Uh, machine learning is a black box and it's still not well understood how it can be used in the downstream studies, um, like the population assessment. And that kind of goes along with what I meant, mentioned earlier about um, not knowing fully right now what kind of machine learning uh, evaluation metrics are going to be required for that population assessment to work well. Um, and then for deploying these algorithms, something that's hard, and this kind of goes with uh, technical debt is software and stack dependency. It's really hard to manage dependencies on different systems and um, to Windows and Linux. Reproducibility, as I mentioned, is very important. Um, and GUIs is something that um, are, need to be sort of provided with these algorithms so that uh, scientists can utilize them. Um, on some challenges on the data side is often people will start collecting data um, with the intention of using ML at some point, but not really. Um, know much about it and so the the way they collect data that they'll often be things that could have been a lot more useful um, for training machine learning algorithms um, that they didn't know at the time and so um, that's definitely a challenge um, benchmark data sets is a lot of big ones that you'll see if you read um, publications about new um, new arch model architectures and new machine learning techniques and and knowing how um, an architecture works on the MS Coco data set doesn't really help me know how it's going to work on my data, which is very small objects that are really sparse, ton of background. Um, there's data generations, which is, um, I sort of mentioned this a bit already, but um, 
as our sort of hardware data collection systems have changed over time, so is the data that we're collecting. And so I can do some things with more recent data and not do the, those things with older data. And there's not many things I can do with all our data. And so it definitely has a challenge. And then the last thing is data policies. And this, I think everyone kind of has to deal with, but it can definitely be a pain sometimes. And that just means it's often security policies. Um, so I'll talk about data pre-processing now. Um, and this ties in quite a bit with actually developing the model, which I'll cover in the next section. So nukes, um, non-uniformity corrections, are images that um, we get a lot of. And, th and this happens when thermal cameras um, warm up over time or environmental changes warm them up or cool them down and they have to recalibrate. And so when they recalibrate, we'll get an Im images that look like this. And these are complete garbage. There's nothing of interest in it. And it wouldn't be a big deal if it wasn't the fact that we have our flight times are often four hours long, three hours long. Um, and so we get quite a few of these. And they um, reduce when, when training infrared models, training with these makes things more challenging as all these little white dots. For some reason, the model kind of struggles with them. Um, and so we're currently using uh, just a standard vision approach to detect these. Um, and then we're hoping soon to be able to detect them on the embedded layer. So actually when we're capturing the photos, reading off the camera, is it currently recalibrating um, and then tagging the image if we are. Um, yeah. Missing labels is one of the larger challenges that I deal with. And as if you look here, you'll see um, all these boxes are proposals from a detector. Um, so detector looked at these images and detected these boxes. Um, and the pink boxes are marked as false positives because they weren't in our initial data set that a human labeled. Um, and so you really need a data set to be fully labeled because when you're training a model, you're basically, if it detects something that is a seal, like most of these things that are in the pink boxes are seals um, or polar bears or something, um, but we were um, penalizing the model for detecting those during training. And so that can be really challenging. And then also when we evaluate the model, it can be really challenging because it's hard to interpret those results if we're not confident that the data set is accurate. Um, get a quick sip of water. So to sort of um, work with it, and yeah, so to sort of uh, get around missing labels, um, the, the way I've approached this um, is with a sort of weekly supervised approach. Um, and there's many ways of doing this, but this is sort of a simple way and the way that I took. And since you take your training data and you train multiple models and you want to kind of train those on different parts of your training data, maybe each model learns data from just one survey so that they kind of learn a little bit of different information um, or train them on the same data, but use very different architectures or approaches um, and then run them against all the training data that the images they're trained on basically rerun them on that. And then um, that will generate a bunch of proposals. And then we want to refine those proposals. So we'll remove existing proposals that are already in our um, ground truth training data data set. And then we'll score new proposals and refine those based on that score. And so there's many ways to the scoring. I'm not going to discuss that right now. But what we end up with is uh, what are called or what are often called weak labels or pseudo labels. And so those are the orange boxes that you can see that weren't in the image before. And then we'll combine those with our initial training data, and then we'll retrain the model that we were initially wanting to train on uh, the initial training data along with these weak labels. And this works really well with our data. And um, the key is sort of the refinement step, making sure like you're always gonna end up with some weak labels that are incorrect. You don't want too many that are incorrect, but it's we also since like 20% of our, our data is like missing about 20% of the labels. Um, we we it, it helps a lot to do this. A um, couple other things along this line uh, that I do um, or that are challenging. Um, one of the big ones is being able to trust when a frame is background. There may be no labels in our training data for that image. Um, but we really want to be confident about that. So we can do a similar thing like we did in the last 
slide where we run models against it and if none of them find anything, we can be fairly confident that it is background. Um, one thing that we're working on right now um, is implementing an iterative process where we actually go back and review those weak labels and integrate them into our training sets. So a human will have manually seen those labels and then we will have them for training later. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, we have a lot of point annotations and we can do something sort of similar to this where we'll run a model against the data, it'll propose a box, and then we'll match the boxes up with the points. And initially I did, the, did this without even a model, just with a blob detector, um, or yeah, just with a blob detector basically um, to propose a box for each point in our infrared training set. Uh, another major challenge is class imbalance, and this is um, pretty common in these kind of remote sensing data sets. Uh, as you can see, we have way more ring seal than any other species, um, very few polar bears. And so the initial thing that makes a lot of sense here is to kind of split this into two different models, because it's gonna be really hard to train a seal and polar bear model. Um, the benefit of training a seal model together, even though there's a big class imbalance between the ringed and bearded seal uh, species, is that um, you want one model to be able to discriminate between the two. If you train two models, one on ring and one on bearded seals, they're both gonna detect all seals as whatever they were trained on because they don't look very different ringed and bearded seals. Um, the seal detection model, uh, I use focal loss, which essentially when you're training the um, neural net, uh, you give more voice to the smaller class when you uh, are doing back when, when you update the weights and that, um, cause if you, if you're, it's gonna see a lot more ring seals when it's training. Um, and so that's gonna be represented sort of in the outcome of how well the model works and you want it to um, do better, better represent the smaller class or re equally represent the smaller class. So you, um, focal loss is a good way of doing that. You can also sample bearded seals more and I do this. Um, I have decided to ignore unknown seals, even though it's quite a few labels. It's actually, uh, and I've tried quite a few ways of dealing with this, like labeling unknown seals as both ringed or bearded seals or, or both. Or, um, and it doesn't work well and it kind of throws the model off. So I just decided to ignore them all together because we have enough of the other seals and, and yeah. And then mosaicing as well. And this is sort of sampling with replacement, but a bit different. Basically what you do is you crop out the animal and then just put it on some background and train with that. And so I do that for polar bear um, as well. And I sample a lot more um, with replacement for that because we have very little polar bear data. And then, so I also do in my training set about a third train, or train validation split. Um, and before deploying the models, especially with the uh, bearded and polar bear classes, which we have very little data on um, all, make that validation set much smaller just to ensure that the final model works um, and train on most of the data that I have. Uh, image chipping or image tiling is just the process of um, breaking a large image up into chunks. And this is something that we have to do a lot of um, because especially with the color, we, and we only actually do this currently with the color data um, because those images are large but it, it kind of raises a lot of questions that aren't, don't have obvious answers. Um, because the chips are relatively small in size, you end up with a lot of cases where animals get cut in half um, by this. And so at what percentage of an animal being on a chip do you, do, do we call it, uh, do we include it um, as an annotation? Um, what, what, what do we do if an unknown seal? I mentioned that we ignore those if it's on the same chip as a classified seal. Um, and then we also have to always uh, re-chip if we change our network input size. But um, the, the considerations about percentage of an animal being on or not on the chip, um, there's not a great answer for how to deal with that. And we don't really have the compute power to like figure it out definitively. Um, so it's sort of something that I've just kind of tried and. Um, and see what worked and just experiment with. So now I'll talk about the model and detection pipeline element and um, talk a bit more about what the picture on the right is in a second. Um, so when choosing a model architecture, as I mentioned before, it's kind of hard to just read um, sort of the theoretical machine learning papers that apply, that, that benchmark their architectures on 
standard data sets because those are looking at things like chairs and zebras, giraffes and bicycles. And it's very different from our data, which is small. Um, very few classes like two seals and polar bear. And those are separate models. So really our biggest model is only learning two classes right now. Um, and then also the objects of interest are very sparsely distributed. So most frames that our model looks at isn't gonna have anything in it. Um, and so since we have multiple sources of imagery of the color, the thermal and the ultraviolet, um, turns out that choosing a model architecture is really closely intertwined with the pipeline architecture that we're gonna choose. And that'll make sense in a second. Uh, so in choosing um, pipeline architecture, I sort of realized that these color images are really large and we have this two frames per second um, kind of goal that we're trying to reach. So it's really too slow to look at this whole image um, with, a, with some sort of neural network. And down sampling this image to a smaller size um, or to a reasonable size is we just lose too much information. Um, so we definitely need to chip as I showed in the previous section on for um, just to get an idea of how many chips we'd end up with. We have 172, 416 pixel chips in a single color image. So that's still a lot of chips. And we really don't have the time at two frames per second to look at all those chips. Um, and so some sort of region-based chip detection is definitely the optimal way to go. And this is actually what we do. And, and the region-based um, detection allows us to not have to look at everything. That's the idea with that. And so this is what that looks like. Um, we have our color and thermal image frames. Um, and so first we'll look at the thermal image in a thermal detector, which will output detections. And then we'll have a decision level layer, which looks at those detections and decides, do we want to look at the color image or not? And if we do, um, where do we want to look in it? And so there's a few parameters here, like how big of an area around the area of interest do we want to look in it? Um, and then maybe there's a maximum of regions that we allow it to look at. Um, and so let's say we decide we found something in the thermal image. Um, we'll then crop those regions out of the color and pass them through the seal color detector and the polar bear color detector. Those will both output detections, um, which we merge. And the final result will look something like what you see. Um, so there's a lot of benefits um, to this late fusion approach. We only full, have to fully process the thermal image, which is really small. So it's very fast. Um, and having this decision level fusion is really flexible and does not usually require retraining. Um, it's easy to add new models. Um, models can have flexible input size because we can kind of swap out models quite easily. And the only thing we have to change are the parameters at the decision level. Um, it reduces false positives a lot for us because um, there are a lot of things that look like seals that show up in the color, but don't show up in the thermal. And by only looking at things that uh, at regions of interest in the thermal in the color image, we really reduce the amount of false positives that we end up getting. Um, and it, this method is also robust to a little bit of error in alignment because we're looking at a region around a detection in the thermal image and not, um, not just at that point. So there's, if we're off by 50 pixels, it's fine because the animal of interest will still be in the region that we're looking at. Um, the downsides of this approach are that the recall, which is how many of all the animals did we find, um, it is bounded by the initial thermal models recall. Um, so if the thermal model doesn't find the animal, then the color won't because we're not gonna look at that region in the color. Um, there's no deep feature correlation in this uh, method between color and thermal um, features. And um, we may still require. Um, so the, the reason we have we are adding ultraviolet is because the polar bear signature on thermal is not great. Um, and it's very different from what the, the seal signature looks like. Um, and so we'll likely be doing some sort of thermal UV early fusion, which is um, kind of look at both of those initially and then decide what to do in the color image. And so now um, that I sort of had a pipeline in mind, we had to choose an actual like machine learning um, model architecture to use. And so I went with YOLO. The benefits of that are off the chart speed. Um, and that just it, with the initial experimentation I did with their data, they worked really well. Um, 
So this uh, on the left, you'll see uh, kind of the diagram of um, the original YOLO v3 architecture, and it detects at three scales. Um, and yeah, and so early on, I realized that we don't need to be using um, the a network as large as the original YOLO v3. And so modifying it for our needs was definitely the way to go and also speeds it up a lot. And so one of the things about YOLO, uh, the way YOLO works is that at each scale, it creates this grid. Um, and it won't actually exactly be a grid of the image, but more of a grid of features. And it will propose one box per grid cell. And so if you have multiple animals in a grid cell, YOLO is going to do a very bad job at detecting them. You might have a grid cell nearby be able to detect two in the same box, but it's unlikely. Um, you have data that's sometimes quite dense. You you definitely need to be careful. And so um, I took a look at, at what that grid looked like on our imagery. Uh, and it turns out that for our thermal, so this image here with the grid drawn over it um, is, is some thermal data from a pretty dense um, region of seals. Um, and these seals are all roughly the same size, they're about eight by eight pixels. And, and so actually just not using all three scales that the original YOLO has, but only using the final small scale um, is all we really need to, to be able to do this on our thermal data. Um, another thing about YOLO's anchors are, um, is it uses anchors to create the boxes. It's a bit of a hack, and I know there's things like CenterNet that do it without anchors. Um, but in order to use YOLO, you have to create anchors for your data. And the way you do this is sort of by clustering all your um, all the boxes in your data set. So that's what you can see in this picture. Um, so each point represents um, the box width and height of every box in our data set. And then we create nine boxes that best represent all the boxes we have. And we use those as our YOLO anchors. And then we train a model. Um, and we remove unused layers. So there are, as I mentioned, three detection layers. If any of those don't seem to be used, we don't need them. And this is more for the color. For the thermal, I actually like, initially looked into it, and we only needed one. But for the color, I wasn't sure which layers we needed and didn't need. Um, and so this was the way that I figured it out for that. Um, and then, so yeah, removing unused layers and removing um, unused anchors within layers and then retraining a model at the end once we have those anchors. Um, the last thing that I sort of modified with YOLO to improve results for us was um, sort of to deal with the missing label challenge. Uh, there's this regularizer that um, is attached to the section of the loss that essentially calculates um, the, um, a false positive during training. So this whole equation is the YOLO loss function, which essentially calculates the error of the model. Um, and so part of that is um, if during training it detects false positives, um, that will increase the error. And so this actually um, reducing uh, this term uh, will reduce the training error. And it works quite well on our data um, because it improves uh, the training loss curve. So you want kind of a smooth training loss curve and this helps us smooth it out. It takes a bit longer to train, um, but it essentially penalizes false positive detections less because those are often actually true positives. We just don't have those labeled in our data set. And so the final um, kind of set of models that we ended up with, and so each of these is a part in, in the pipeline. I, uh, shared earlier in the late fusion pipeline. Um, so we have an infrared hotspot model um, with just one detection layer. Input size is the infrared input size. And um, the thing that I changed with that was what I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, reducing that regularizer. Um, and the default, I think, is one. So it's um, half of the penalty. Uh, the color polar bear model, three layers. Seal color model, also three layers. And then we use focal loss for that, as I discussed previously. And so the evaluation of our results. And so this is um, only the model evaluation. Um, and so um, this is different from evaluating the pipeline. Um, this 
really is it, it's hard to um it's hard to evaluate because you don't necessarily need to look at all the chips in an image you'll end up with a lot of false positives and so this about th these metrics are um a one-to-one -one, um background to seal or to animal chip and so for every evaluation chip with an animal in it there will be a background chip and so that's not very much background relative to the data we're working with um, and so recall should be the same um, with real data but precision will be lower because there'll be more false positives um, but in a second i'll talk a little bit about pipeline validation results because we have some preliminary ones and then for hot spots we do actually look at the full thermal frame because we're not chipping and so these results are um, pretty much what you'd see with the, with the pipeline um, and so as you see our models work quite well. Um, the polar bear one definitely struggles because there's not a lot of data, but it actually it actually works quite well. So uh, it's just, um, we're really trying to get the recall for polar bears up and the precision doesn't matter as much. And, and that's been the challenge. Um, and as you can all see the, um, the speed of these models uh, is definitely good enough for what we need with the late fusion pipeline approach. And we actually have quite a bit of wiggle room now as we begin to add more um species to the late fusion layer and so these are uh, very preliminary results i actually just got this data like a few days ago um th this data was collected this past spring and um the human manually went through and annotated about twenty thousand color frames identifying 19 seals which gives you an idea of just how sparse our data is um so we then went and ran our machine learning late fusion pipeline that I showed earlier on all this data. Um, and one of the challenges is that if the thermal image is a noop, um, is, is when the camera is calibrating, then um, it's not really fair to the pipeline because it's not going to necessarily look at the color image of that. So the human didn't look at the nuked image and the model didn't look at the nuked pairs because we want to know simply what um what did the human find that the model has the possibility to find um and so there were in total 534 thermal detections um which is quite a few false positives but when you think about how many images it looked at um it definitely reduces the amount of manual work required and also we set the uh, confidence threshold um for it to look at a color image pretty low at 0.1 so it's it's a lot of these thermal detections and as you can see with the average confidence are quite low um, and then after that, it picked up 109 color detections. So it would trigger on the color images and found 109 um, things uh, with an average confidence of 0.18. So 90 of those were false positives. The thermal detector found all 19 hotspots on the frames that the human identified. Um, it also found one frame that the human did not find, but it missed the seal um, because it was only the head was visible. The seal was on the edge of the image and the human also missed that seal. Um, and yeah, so these, these results are very preliminary and they give me a bit of an idea of how things are working, but um, we're really hoping to soon have actual results to share. Um, and so now I'll talk, I think this is the final section about deploying these. And this is sort of one of the major challenges I've dealt with because it's definitely not enough to just develop these pipelines and detectors, um, making them usable by others is really important. And so we, um, be before I arrived, uh, a lot of work was done um, with a company called Kitware, uh, who develops, um, who, who's developed these um, open source softwares that you can see um, for annotation and for pipeline running. And so the way it kind of works at the bottom, you see SProKit is sort of a library for defining pipelines and configurations um, and for data streaming. And on top of that is Quiver, which brings in all these different common computer vision components and libraries um, and languages as well. So you can create a pipeline with, with um, sections in different languages and um, or with, with processes in different languages and it will work. And that's something that's really not easy to do on your own um, outside of a um, framework like this. And then at the highest level, and this runs, these all kind of run off quiver in the background. Um, our GUIs for annotating uh, for annotating data and running detection pipelines, and we also have a tool called Camera, 
which was developed, and that is our sort of embedded aerial um, uh, aerial data collection system. So it's what is um, sort of interfacing directly with the cameras to collect data and then running our machine learning pipelines. And so because all these different GUI tools um, or, or our deployment tool run off of Quiver, it's really, uh, it makes deploying pipelines really easy because um, I have confidence that uh, a pipeline run in one tool will produce the same results as a pipeline run in another tool. Um, it also makes it really easy for me if I'm experimenting with different things to swap out um, models um, because uh, Quiver comes with all these libraries kind of pre-baked into it. So if I want to deploy a TensorFlow model, I really just have to change one section of the pipeline and everything else will still work the same. Um, all the, yeah, so as I mentioned, all these dependencies are built into Quiver. And so, um, and yeah, in terms of reproducibility, it gives me a lot of confidence because they, um, as, lo as long as I trust that their, their software is um, well tested and it is, um, then it gives me a lot of confidence in the reproducibility of the results from their tools. And be a lot of work for me to do this on my own. And so being able to do it through a framework like this saves me a lot of time and allows me to work on other things like developing models. Um, reproducibility is kind of the last thing to talk about, which I mentioned earlier is being really, really important for us. There's sort of two places where reproducibility is important. Um, and one is in developing um, machine learning models. And uh, it's, it's important because it helps me kind of track my experiments just as um, someone in another field would like to track their experiments so they can know what they did and what the outcome of that was. It's really useful machine learning. So tracking input data, what pre-processing pre -processing steps were used, any augmentations used, what networks were used, maybe weight initializations. Um, and it's, it's really hard to keep track of all this. And I definitely don't do a perfect job. Um, but I do have my sort of internal systems of doing as much as I can. And it helps me. But luckily, this isn't the critical information that we need to track. What we really need to track is stuff that um, creates um, data products that are used in the downstream research and downstream publications. And so this is um, tracking our pipelines and our pipeline runs. So tracking inputs that went through a pipeline, tracking models used in a pipeline, um, tracking the transformations used, um, and that's the alignment stuff I was talking about earlier, and also being able to then associate the derived results, the detections, or even the georegister detections with, with where those came from, what pipeline, what model, um, so that in the future, if there's any questions, makes it really easy to go back and rerun that pipeline. Um, and so, yeah, we almost have that capability. We're finishing up a big round of work right now um, that will basically mean we can do all this, um, which is really excited, e exciting. And yeah, that's, I think this is the last slide I have. Yeah, and as, yeah, this has been a huge effort by a lot of people in developing the hardware systems, the software, going out in these surveys, collecting images, um, and it's been really cool to kind of see how AI is actually able to help in the real world. Um, and, and it does seem like it's going to really, really reduce the amount of time that it takes to process this data. And I think that's it. If anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, I get to ask the, the first question. Um, and actually, before I ask the first question, um, I should mention that if you um, if you are taking the survey for uh, PDH credit, then the password is seals, all lowercase. Um, so <clears throat> my question, uh, well, first of all, I appreciate the presentation, um, I, especially how you took a, a project that to some people, but the face of it might seem, oh, it's Pretty, it seems like pretty straightforward. You can count these seals, but when you dive into it, there's so many of these other aspects that really uh, complicate the system. Um, and then also taking what was previously a, a manual process and um, <clears throat> and how to convert that into one that you can apply machine learning. Um, so I guess um, my, my thought was about um, <clears throat> you. one thing it seems like you have going for you is there aren't a lot of classes to learn and like there aren't a lot of different marine mammals out there. 
Um, have you have you um, thought about trying to classify additional remand? What kind of discussion you had, like including walruses, for example, or other kinds of um, um, animals that might appear in the surveys? Yeah, so we'll be adding a few more seal species soon. It's really about not having labeled data for them right now. Um, I think because these are on the protected species list, this program was kind of created to monitor their populations. Um, and so those were kind of the priority at first to label. And I think there will be ribbon seals and then another two seal species, I don't remember what they were, um, that I will get data for very soon. I think it's currently under final review. Um, yeah, so there's, but there's, I don't think there will be an intention on doing many. I don't think walruses will probably be part of this. Um, and I don't think there's an intention on adding a lot more classes. Um, we're definitely trying to focus also soon on improving the polar bear capabilities because um, there aren't a lot of polar bears out there and it's, we don't have a lot of data for it. And we really want to try to find them when we have them in our data. Um, and so that, that's definitely a priority going forward as well. All right, uh, while I've got the floor, I guess another quick question is um, you had mentioned you had just started with the UV um, data. How are you, how are you gonna incorporate that into the, integrate that into the, the system? Yeah, so I don't actually have any labeled UV data yet, but we do have UV data now um, from the spring. And I think my initial idea is to, because the, the, th the issues with detecting the polar bear signatures and the thermal data, I think, that we really need to look at the UV sort of in the early stage of the fusion pipeline. And so it'll probably look at both the UV and the thermal and then trigger looking into the color image. Um, and the, the UV image is larger, but it's only one channel. So it's still significantly smaller than the color image. Um, and we can probably downsample that. So we can, I think, still keep our two frames per second speed while looking at both the thermal and the UV image. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, you all for sharing. Uh, I did have a question for you. What did you find in your work the most surprising and uh, interesting? Hmm, that's an interesting question I haven't really thought about. Um, how well YOLO works on a data set like this, because it, it's been used in a lot of um, different cases and, and it's starting, it, it is now becoming one of the more popular choices for sort of aerial surveys or surveys with small objects. And so I was definitely initially very surprised to see how well YOLO, even just out of the box without any modifications worked on this data. And actually our initial round of detectors were basically out of the box YOLO that was just trained on our data. Um, and optimizing improved those, but wasn't, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, and, and I do have a different question. Uh, the question is about how, what, what would need to change to look for um, other animals, not, not seals necessarily, but maybe something, you know, more on the opposite spectrum, something that we have a lot of, something like moose or something like that in Alaska, how would you modify your, your work to answer those questions? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to know without looking at that data, because if there's trees and stuff like that, it may make it kind of, it'll add other sort of challenges that you may not have thought of, but um, I think this would work, this approach would work pretty well on that. Um, obviously you have to retrain on moose, but. Um, as you saw, the, so the test data we have from 2019 is very dense, actually. Um, you saw those couple images where the uh, hot spots and the thermal images were really close together. And so, so it works quite well when there's a lot of animals really close together. Um, yeah, so I think this approach would work on that. Um, it would just require moose training data. Uh, well, we do have a question here. Uh, they asked, how you can tell the difference between a polar bear and a seal with similar size with the yellow? Yeah, um, so currently, uh, because the models, we have a polar bear and a seal model, um, there's no kind of deep learned method of figuring out which is a seal and which is a polar bear. And actually um, for us right now, because we're really trying to find all the polar bears, 
Um, we output both the seal and the polar bear detection for reviewers to look at. And so there is actually no decision currently happening of whether something is a seal or a polar bear, if both models detect that thing. Um, we just output both detections. Okay, well, that looks like the, all the questions that we have. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, so thank you, you all, for giving this uh, presentation. And um, that concludes our seminar series for the week. Hope we see you um, for the next one. Thanks, bye.